Welcome back to Mark Haney, igniting the entrepreneurial revolution with the Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Hub International. I'm Mark Haney, and today I am here with Dan Bout, the Assistant Director for Response for the California Office of Emergency Services. And we need you today, Dan. We've got some emergencies happening in this country. They're happening in Sacramento, but... Uh, even more broadly, uh, all over California. What's I mean? What's going on right now in California? That's that's right. I guess uh, in the middle of your radar. So well, there, there's a host of incidents. Um, I think the most, the one that's on the forefront right now are the wildfires we have. So across the state, we have a number of major wildfires. Uh, uh, Tom Keegan mentioned, you know, the California National Guard is providing that aviation support in support of uh, Cal Fire. And, and so, you know, throughout the state, you have these fires. Some of them are happening deep in, you know, in the woods. Essentially, they don't have a lot of impacts, but many of these are burning close to our communities, right? And, and so as soon as one of these wildfires creeps into an area where it starts putting homes and property mm -hmm. at risk, that obviously raises its profile, how we allocate assets against those fires. Um, and so those are burning, again, up and down the state. We have some tropical moisture that's coming in that's causing a lot of uh, lightning strikes. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, that starts more of these fires as we go along. And then, um, and then of course, we have the incident, the unfortunate incident you referenced uh, in Sacramento where uh, uh, we lost an officer earlier this week, and we're doing yeah. a memorial for that. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the fire situation first. Where are the hot spots today, and what, what do we expect moving forward? Is there any way to predict what, what's going to happen? Well, we're fortunate in that CAL FIRE and uh, the U.S. Forest Service have incredible modelers. So what they're doing is they're looking at, you know, where the winds are, they're looking at the, the weather, and they're kind of forecasting based on all these different factors where they think the fire will go. Now, fire is pretty inherently unpredictable. A lot of time it's creating its own weather. And so it'll jump containment lines. It'll move into areas that we thought we had good containment on or, um, or it'll move in directions we didn't anticipate. And so it changes on a day-by-day, on a day, if not hour-by-hour hour basis. You know, today being, uh, or this week being the anniversary of 9-11, it makes me think about the, my friends who are in the fire service. And I know some of them uh, spent some time in law, or excuse me, in uh, the military and then have uh, gone on to become firefighters. And so many people were influenced by 9-11 to go out and join the Marines, join the Army, uh, become a firefighter. How do you think 9-11 has, uh, has changed things for America? Well, I mean, I think it, it changed enormously. I mean, you mentioned there's a lot of people who, who had a, a sense of, of calling to help our country. Right, and that expressed itself a lot of times with joining the armed services. But a lot of times there were people who became first responders because they looked at those, those heroes in uh, the aftermath of what happened in New York and the Pentagon, and they said, you know, that this means something to me, right? This person's life has meaning, they made a difference, and I wanna be part of that community. And so there's an enormous amount of first responders that you know, really felt that first calling when they mm -hmm. saw the aftermath. Well, I think a lot of, that's when I saw America come together. We're watching, uh, this on the news, my son and I, is where I'm getting ready to take him to school, and he ended up joining the Marines. But I remember that time being a time when America came together, and it just makes me, I get, and then now you see us maybe separating in some ways and for, for certain reasons. And I'm wondering, what can we do as ordinary citizens? Obviously, you have a, a huge influence in bringing people together, but what can we do to bring people together? Does it really take tragedy to bring people together? Wow, that's, um, I don't know that it takes a tragedy to do it, but you know, anytime you have these precipitating events, something where people really question what, what has value to me, right? Um, that's when you, tar you start to see this. I mean, it happened in, in Harvey, and I, I'm sure it's happening right now in Florida. People band together when they have, like, you know, something that a reason to band together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and short of that, a lot of times you don't see that uh, quite as much. You know, you'll see the the clicks form, and like, I mean, just it's a lot of times very similar to grade school, right? People will <laughs> yeah. hang around the people that they meet, they know, and uh, it's not they're trying to exclude anyone. It's just their circles relatively. Uh, you know, associated with their immediate interests. And well, then, yeah, well, how would you compare what's going on in California and the kinds of disasters that we face, I guess natural disasters, uh, when it comes to fire, earthquake, 
How would you compare that to the devastation that, that other states might see? Obviously, what's going on right now with Harvey and Irma is off the charts. At the, that's at level 10 in terms of uh, a nightmare, I suppose. But how does California stack up to, um, to that in terms of uh, natural disaster and emergency needs? Right. So, I mean, the, most of what you see is the emergency management infrastructure, right? So the, what we would call the incident command system. So the, the, the DNA for how we respond, not just in the United States, but internationally, started here in California because we had such an enormous uh, wildfire threat because the kind of incidents we face, whether they be catastrophic earthquakes or catastrophic flooding, um, are of such a magnitude that we have to kind of have these, these rules for how people will coordinate in large disasters. So from the framework of capabilities, we have, I would, I would argue, the best capabilities in the world. But again, to match that, we have these threats. You know, unlike what we're seeing with the hurricanes, where you have multiple days of notice, when our earthquakes hit, we won't have but a few seconds of, of notification. Um, and, and so that's a whole different dynamic, because you have no time to prepare. Uh, other than what you put into practice beforehand. What is preparation? So there's no way to prepare for an earthquake, I take it. But what about fire? Is there a way to prepare um, for fire? Well, I should be clear. There actually are things you can do, right? Okay. So, and, and, and these are things that are easy to miss. Um, but things like having a, a, a kit at home, right? Talking with your children about, hey, here's what we're going to do if a disaster happens. Making sure you talk to your daycare provider or school and know, hey, if this happens, right, if we have an earthquake, if there's a scenario and I can't contact the school, where are, you, where are the children, what's their safe area? What's the procedure to pick them up? And a lot of times parents, you know, they assume that, well, the, the school saw through it, and assuredly they have, but if you don't know that answer and now you can't, talk, you can't call your school because the phone lines are down, now you're in a panic situation. Yeah. Right? You and plan. you're not thinking at your best, right? And so, yeah, like anything, you want to have a plan beforehand. You want to have thought through at least, here's what we're going to do. And now you don't feel that like pit of your stomach, like I'm unprepared when it happens. Well, let's talk about your the overarching uh, career um, that you have, Dan. Uh, you're also an Army lieutenant colonel, right? You're in the reserves. Talk to us about that and, and maybe just how your career, what inspired you to take on this uh, this role of helping out uh, our community, helping out our country. So, um, so I joined back in the '90s, um, and I, I enlisted in the active duty army um, initially just because I needed college money. I was, you know, I was like, "Hey, this is great." You know, yeah. you see the kind of the the commercials and you know, rappelling out of helicopters. Yeah, and like, looks That's fun. What I'm do. You're an athlete, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I joined, and it, it kind of became a little bit of a calling. I really appreciate. I like being with the the infantrymen down in the dirt. Um, I had a couple deployments on active duty. Uh, but at the time, these weren't combat deployments. It was like Bosnia, Herzegovina. And, uh, and then uh, I, I left active service because I wanted to finish graduate school. That's why I enlisted in the first place. And so when 9-11 happened, I I'd actually uh, I was just a newly commissioned officer now in the infantry. And uh, I was teaching graduate courses at UC Davis. Um, and, and then, you know, so the you're a newly commissioned officer in the infantry and you're teaching classes at UC Davis. Right. Okay. And okay. So talk to us about what happened from there. So I was in their uh, doctoral program. And so the first thing I did was, you know, I, I basically called in and said, Hey, I can't teach class today. Um, and you know, so I was a active guardsman. I reported to the headquarters and said, okay, so, you know, where are you sending me? Uh, because, you know, I was so used to active duty. And actually, there was a, a host of missions that the, the, the guard was filling, right, for homeland security type functions. And so they found one of those, and I took a, a, a time off from school. And actually, only took about a month off. Uh, so I was scheduled for deployment. Uh, this was in the spin-up uh, prior to the actual war. Okay. Uh, and that, I had about two or three months. So, you know, I remember when I went into, um, into course, there's a lot of questions. You know, oh, where, where were you for the first month? And, and it, was, it was a little interesting because we're still in that period where people really didn't realize how disconnected they were from the military. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had students asking me, like, what, you know, they're like, okay, so you're a, you're a ranger? I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they're like, well, what national park? Because it was just this <laughs> absolute disconnect from... I'm special forces, sir. <laughs> right, uh, right. So, uh, you know, but, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting time uh, because there was such a, yeah. you know, the military had been a very much an afterthought until this all happened in many people's lives. You know, today's an interesting show. We got to wrap it up. But I, and, I, and so I have to thank you, uh, Dan, for, for sharing your story. We, we got it cut off short because we have uh, Rick and Rita Cobb coming up, detectives from uh, Riverside. But it just shows me... In talking to you, and I think it tells our, our audience, 
You know, you guys are just normal guys. You put your le- pants on one leg at a time, yet you put your life on the line. You're out there, you know, when the phone rings uh, and there's an emergency, somebody's got to answer that phone. And, uh, and I want to thank you for being one of those guys. And uh, thanks for coming on the show today. When, when we return again, we'll have Rick and Rita Cobb, two detectives from Riverside, join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com. Brought to you courtesy of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Sacramento and law firm Greenberg Trorg. This is the Haney Biz Project.